TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And with me now is a man who talks about jihad a lot, even though deep down he knows it's an internal spiritual struggle. And we've been talking about our jihad over the past couple of weeks. Robert, uh, my wife has the flu right now. Uh, our, our youngest son is just getting over the flu. Uh, I had some stuff to do, but in spite of that, I went to the grocery store and got my wife some ginger ale because she said it was the only thing that wouldn't make her sick. So I went all the way to the grocery store. I got some ginger ale, even got two kinds of ginger ale. Anyway, that's my jihad. What's yours? David, I'm very happy to announce after a season of procrastination, my jihad this week has been to start the new book. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, sir. And so finally we are embarked. Got to turn it in June 2nd, I believe it is. And uh, that gives me what? March, April and May. That's um, a serious. By the way, what's the book about? This one's called Woke Religion and it's about woke religion that is some serious jihad action you've got going on there but uh, as you I'll know that. as you know robert uh even though the real jihad is this internal spiritual struggle that you and i are waging to get stuff done or to go to the store uh there is this other kind of jihad that some people believe in you know like muhammad and allah uh, Surely you're not referring to the widespread misunderstanding of jihad as having something to do with violence against those who are not Muslim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People keep misinterpreting the clear, unambiguous calls for violence in the Quran and the Hadith, uh, the clear calls to violently subjugate the entire world. People keep misunderstanding them and thinking that they mean what they say and not realizing that they mean something the perhaps the exact opposite of what they say uh so people keep misunderstanding islam in the same way because they don't realize that whatever allah and muhammad say it it means the exact opposite of what it but sounds you're like you're saying right you're, hmm? you're you're putting me on aren't you david right now because we all know the quran is the clear book well yeah but notice it says it's clear over and over and over again like a beating drum but if Allah always means the exact opposite of what he says, then it's horribly unclear. And hence, all of the passages that sound like they're calling for violent jihad are actually calling for peace and tolerance. So you're not, you're not understanding the Western method of interpreting Islam's most reliable sources, Robert. This is what makes it such a beautiful book. I know. Dave, that it's, it's really kind of an endless labyrinth of joy because... You delve into it and you think that when it says, kill them wherever you find them, it means something ugly, vicious, and violent. But actually, when you understand it properly, then you see the deep love that is meant mm -hmm. to be conveyed. Exactly. Passage. Exactly. And that's why we can say unequivocally that all the people who are out waging jihad because they think Allah means what he says, and they think Muhammad means what he says, and not the exact opposite. They are misunderstanders of Islam. But unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of people misunderstand Islam because they don't reinterpret it the way we do. And so we have to, we have to keep exposing these people for misunderstanding their religion so that hopefully they'll get on board and understand that the true jihad is this internal uh, spiritual struggle. And so instead of slaughtering unbelievers in the name of Allah, they'll go to the grocery store, they'll, they'll start working on their book and things like that. All right, Robert, so let's get to uh, exposing these misunderstanders of Islam. What do we got? Well, David, this week, I believe all the news is focused on Ukraine and Russia, and of course that is not a jihad. I hasten to assure the world in any way, shape, or form. It is not a jihad by the proper understanding of jihad according to Islamic theology, and it is not a jihad according to the whitewashed Western understanding of jihad. However, Vladimir Putin has reportedly made use of a group of jihadis from Chechnya. Smart. Chechnya being a semi-autonomous region in the Caucasus 
a Muslim region, where Ramzan Kadyrov, the the strongman of the area, is a client of Vladimir Putin. In exchange for having more or less a free hand to apply Sharia, he has to make his troops available if Putin needs them. And so a group of Chechen jihadis went into Ukraine over the last few days, and the Chechen Mufti said that they are on the path of Allah. And so this is uh, uh, certainly something that is being placed into the context of Islamic theology. Uh, interestingly enough, in Ukraine, there is a group of uh, actual Nazis, the Azov fighters, who, I mean, I'm the real Nazis, you know, they carry around the, the, the Nazi flag and uh, they have avowedly Nazi principles. But they were hearing about the Chechen jihadis coming and they started to grease their bullets with pig fat. And they announced that this would prevent the jihadis from going into paradise were they to be killed in Ukraine. And I thought, well, that's actually one thing. These people are Nazis. They are to be abhorred and rejected in every way, except they do understand that Islamic paradise is physical. The mm -hmm. martyrs, those who are killed in the cause of Allah, their bodies are not washed before burial because the blood on the body is, is, is a, a kind of an aphrodisiac for the virgins of paradise. And so the presence of pig fat on the bodies, actually there is a case that can be made that that would make the virgins repulsed and prevent one's entry into paradise. And uh, th a lot of people don't realize how seriously there, certain people take, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to be, wanting your body to be 100% halal your entire life. I was reading about the situation with uh, the Uyghurs uh, over the past couple decades, and uh, apparently they're not doing it as much as they were, or they've stopped it, but the Chinese government was selling uh, organs, so they're doing organ harvesting, and it was it was wealthy Middle Easterners who needed an organ, but they didn't want they didn't want to get an organ transplant from someone who'd ever had alcohol or eaten pork. So they would come to China and say, "Hey, uh, I need some organs." China, China would do the tests, find you a match among the Uyghurs, and then, oopsie, that person got executed. Here's the organs. And so there are lots of people who take that very seriously. But but Robert, I, I'm confused. Shouldn't Nazis be on the same side with jihadis? I mean, isn't that what happened back when you had Hitler? W weren't they on the same side? Oh, there's no doubt they were, David. Hajimin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, lived in Berlin from 1941 to 45. He was a close friend of Heinrich Himmler. He met with Hitler, and he gave very strong uh, order, not orders, but uh, he very strongly advised the Nazis to embark on their program of mass killing of the Jews. He made broadcasts to the Arab world in Arabic, quoting the Quran, the Quran's anti-Semitic passages in particular, to try to garner support for the Nazis. And he argued before the Nazis that they couldn't deport the Jews, they'd just end up in Palestine, and that would cause trouble for the Muslims. So they should just kill them all there. And it's interesting to note that Haj Amin al-Husseini actually was a a uh, soldier for the Ottoman Empire during World War I at the time of the Armenian Genocide. And Hitler very notably said when he was asked about the mass killing of the Jews, he said the world won't care. Uh, who today remembers the Armenians? And may, it's very possible that he was thinking about the Armenians and the Armenian Genocide because of the advice of the Mufti. But there's no doubt the Mufti strongly argued for the mass killing of the Jews and actively worked to prevent the Germans from deporting Jews out of Europe in order to prevent them from going to the Holy Land. And so uh, not too long ago, <clears throat> Nazis and jihadis were on the same side, um, due in large part to their mutual hatred for Jews, uh, but now they're actually divided and on opposite sides of a war. Very, very strange times we're living in where Nazis yeah. and jihadis are on different sides here. It's a confused right. situation, such a confused situation there in Russia and Ukraine. 
Uh, I mean, just for example, this is not mean this to say this does not mean that I'm pro Putin, but it's nonetheless an interesting factoid that has not been well reported. And, and but before before you say that, I can't stand Putin, everyone. <laughs> yes, yes. I said I said on Twitter earlier he's the Ivan Drago of Kim Jong Un's. So oh, j- so good. I'm just saying that because I know Robert's about to hail uh, hail Putin as the great <laughs> hero of the world. <laughs> no, I just note that. Volodymyr Zelensky, who is the big hero right now, the president of Ukraine, uh, justifiably admired for his courage, he doesn't speak Ukrainian. When he made his famous speech, his now famous speech, calling on the Ukrainians to resist the Russians, he was speaking in Russian. He doesn't even know Ukrainian. This is just an example of how confused and confusing the situation is there. But that's not jihad, David, so we'll move on. (laughs) Let's go to Somaliland, where uh, the traffickers in female genital mutilation, they uh, experienced a bit of a business downturn during the uh, COVID crisis. I should note that Somaliland is the northern part of the country of Somalia, recognized throughout the world as being part of Somalia, but the country, the land, the area that calls itself Somaliland does not acknowledge the government in Mogadishu, has its own capital and its own government in the city of Hargeisa. And in any case, it's another Muslim country or semi-country. And the uh, cutters, the practitioners of female genital mutilation, have begun to go door to door now because of COVID to do house calls and bring their services to the little girls in Somaliland. What's interesting about this is there was a lengthy AP, Associated Press Story, one of the leading news organizations in the world. Very lengthy story a couple days ago about this. And a couple times the AP tells us that this practice has nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Islam. But then it also tells us several times that it's imams and Islamic religious leaders who have interfered time and time again with efforts to get it outlawed. Now, why is that? Obviously, AP doesn't know or doesn't want you to know, but Muhammad in a Hadith says that its circumcision is an honor for both men and for women, uh, gives instructions on how much a, uh, a, a girl should be actually cut in this practice of genital mutilation. And so it's because of Muhammad's obvious acceptance of the practice that it persists today in Somaliland and many other areas. And uh, Aisha, in, in one hadith, uh, she even described sex as the meeting of the circumcised parts. So she doesn't just say, hey, it's sex. She just she, she calls sex the meeting of the circumcised parts. So it's just taken for granted that the man and, well, I was going to say woman, but in this case, little, little tiny girl child, right, yeah. uh, were both circumcised, which in the case of, you know, that, that's, that's, that's female genital mutilation. Um, but and she's the mother of the believers. Yeah, she's the revered figure in Sunni Islam, widely reviled and hated, of course, in Shiite Islam. But in Sunni Islam, she's a big hero. And if she had it done, mm-hmm. then obviously every girl should. Yeah. So, so Robert, so what you're saying, so what you're saying here about Somaliland is that because of COVID, the economy was negatively affected. Because the uh, female genital mutilators who made their living off uh, from cutting uh, the clitorises of little girls, um, because of COVID restrictions, they couldn't do their job. And so now that the COVID restrictions are starting to lift, now they can go around and, and, uh, and jumpstart the economy again by going door to door. Yes, that's right. And so their business is picking back up because there is ongoing demand for this. And uh, the article is very interesting in noting that even though this has nothing to do with Islam, it is uh, again and again the religious leaders who stymie efforts to stop it. And uh, one anti-FGM campaigner even says, uh, outlawing it doesn't do any good. Mm -hmm. They've outlawed it Mm -hmm. over and over again in several uh, Muslim countries. But... Because of, and this is the part she leaves unsaid, but it's obvious, because of the sanction of Muhammad, man, what is considered to be man-made law can never override the law of Allah, and the law of Allah says it's all right. 
Yeah, and I, I saw this on an episode of Law and Order recently where there was a case where uh, I wasn't paying attention to the beginning, but someone got killed and it was over a dispute over whether to uh, uh, circumcise the daughter. And when this got, when the issue got brought before the lawyer, the lawyer said, well, there's no religion that uh, that yes. advocates female circumcision. And so it's just interesting that, uh, that you know, it's journalists, it's uh, writers of TV shows who are always somehow equipped to explain what Islam does and does not teach to the rest of the world. And it's the same people are saying, yeah, but the imams, they do, so, you know, the sheikhs, they're on a different page from, you know, the real authorities here, uh, you know, law and order uh, script writers. Yeah. <laughs> David, it also should be noted, it's not just picking on Islam or Muslims to say that this is something that is allowed and justified in Islamic texts. In the first place, it's just a fact, but it's also an important fact because there are plenty of campaigns that you can find to stamp out female genital mutilation. And I have never yet seen one of these campaigns acknowledge why it is so prevalent. And until, less and until they do that, they're doomed to fail. Because whatever arguments they bring to bear about health, about psychological well-being, about the dignity of women, about any number of other things, none of those will override the will of Allah. And as long as people think it's the will of Allah, it's going to keep going. And it, it, it's, a, it's a parallel situation with jihad and with killing apostates and with all these other things that everyone's, everyone in the West seems to think the only way to deal with this problem, because you can't criticize the religion and you can't criticize Muhammad and you can't criticize the Quran. You can't criticize any of that. So the only way of dealing with these problems is just to say, well, these things have nothing to do with Islam. And oopsie, wow, it's not stopping. It's, in fact, it's just increasing. Oh my goodness, it's getting worse. How is this happening when we keep saying that it has nothing to do with Islam? Well, guess what? Muslims aren't getting their definitions of Islam from a bunch of Western reporters and television writers. It's like they live in a fantasy land. I think they're narcissists. I think they're just narcissists. Yes, indeed. No doubt about it. Uh, they don't want it to be true. And they think that they've been told, of course, that it's racist, bigoted, and Islamophobic to say that it's true, and consequently, it must not be true. Yep. Uh, you know, one that one thing that I should have noted, David, when we were talking about Ukraine, is that uh, it's not also it, it, another aspect of the confusion is that there are Muslims on the other side as well. It's not just they're on, they're not only just fighting for Putin. Uh, there is an accused Iranian spy, Kaveh Asrabiabi, and uh, he is Afrasiabi, excuse me, and he is on trial right now for espionage, and he has asked that his trial be delayed. He wrote a letter to the judge, says, I write this letter to request to be granted a temporary leave to join the International Legion formed by Ukraine to support its war of independence against Russian aggression. And he notes that if he were allowed to go, it would set a good example for other Muslims in the international Muslim community, particularly in light of the fact that Putin has mobilized Chechen jihadis on his side. So uh, there seem to be people who believe that there is an Islamic aspect to both sides of that conflict. Meanwhile, our friends in Afghanistan, the Taliban, have given some wise advice to the combatants. They have noted that all parties in Ukraine need to desist from taking positions that could intensify violence. Now, I had to laugh when I saw that because I thought, well, what group is more violent than the Taliban? But of course, we must understand that in Ukraine and in regard to Russia, that's violence as far as the Taliban is concerned, because that is non-Muslims killing other non-Muslims. But when Muslims make war against non-Muslims, that's not senseless violence. That's the will of Allah. And so it's not to be classified with the kind of action that we see with the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And so when the Taliban says they need to stop intensifying the violence, they're not being silly or hypocritical they are actually reflecting their worldview, which does not see what they do as violent at all. It's, it's rather like we saw so many Islamic groups after 9-11 condemning terrorism. 
And only when we read the fine print did we see, oh, they don't mean the planes flying into the World Trade Center. They mean the actions of the U.S. government and the Israeli government. That's terrorism as far as they're concerned, not what they do. Well, can't go wrong with the Taliban, what I always say. <laughs> hey, yep. Mr. Taliban, Taliban. Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one quick comment. Hey, Reasoned Answers, Apologetics Videos. Yes, I've seen your, I haven't watched your uh, debate challenge, but uh, I've seen it. It's just everyone sick here and I'm taking care of people. So uh, pretty rough, pretty rough week right now. But yes, I will, I will check that out when I get a chance. Somebody challenge you to debate? Yes, but it's a Christian. So I don't know what, he's, I'm assuming he's got something up his sleeve here. Yikes. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, uh, let's go to Connecticut, shall we? Mm -hmm. And in Connecticut, we have a new thing that we have not seen in Connecticut before, and that is the Sunni Shiite Jihad, which has been going on for 1,400 years, but not so much in Connecticut. However, recently at the University of Connecticut, the uh, Shiite community, the Shiite student community, was given a gift by some people in Iraq. They gave them some turbas which is the uh, little disc that is made out of sacred soil from Karbala. And they prostrate and put their forehead on that, on that sacred soil. They don't just prostrate onto the ground. Sunnis consider this to be bida, innovation. And so when the Sunnis saw this lovely gift of turbas from Iraq in the Muslim Student Center, they threw them in the garbage. The Shiites, of course, were enraged and demanded an apology, and the Sunni Muslim Student Association said they would meet with them, but they did not. They gave a perfunctory apology, which did not satisfy the Shiites. The Shiites have now complained to the university administration and have said that there need to be seminars to correct misconceptions about Shiite Islam so that this kind of thing, <laughs> so that this kind of thing does I, I, not... Again. I am all for making Sunnis <laughs> sit down and watch some uh, misunderstanding of some Shia Islam uh, stuff so they know how the rest of us feel when they try to make us do all, do all that stuff. Uh, oh, well, uh, yeah. Well, hey, maybe maybe Connecticut can rename its state uh, the uh, Sunni Shia Jihad state since it's, yeah, start, since it's starting up there. Catchy license plate slogan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Home of the Sunni Shiite Jihad. Home of the Sunni, home of the Sunni Shia American divide, something yeah. like that. So that's the news from Connecticut. Let me see. I think there is another one from the United States, but I'm not seeing it right now. Uh, it'll still be. Oh, here we go. Yes, uh, Girl Scout troop in San Diego. Uh, this was a story out of KPBS in San Diego, the uh, public radio, national public radio and all that. And uh, it seems that a local Girl Scout troop in San Diego is made up almost entirely of Somali Muslim migrant girls. Mm -hmm. And so a nonprofit group called United Women of East Africa got together with this uh, Muslim Girl Scout troop and they had a little seminar about their Islamic religion. And uh, one, of, one of the girls who was there says, we'll read all about women in Islam, the key roles that they had, that women are looked at equal to men, uplifting and empowering so that they know, so, oh, this is one of the uh, adults, excuse me, so that they know their religion is not something they should be ashamed of, but something they should be proud of. Now, in a certain sense, this is fine, except for the fact that women are not considered equal to men in Islam. The Quran, in the beginning of the notorious wife-beating verse, chapter 4, verse 34, it says, men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has made the one excel the other or in other translations, made the one superior to the other. That is, men superior to women. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of things that uh, reinforce that inferiority of women, 
the fact that a woman's testimony is a worth half that of a man. A woman inherits half what her brothers inherit. Um, most of the inhabitants of Hellfire are women because of their deficiency in intellect and religion. On and on and on. And of course, the wife beating itself, there's no husband beating. And so you have these things in Islam that these girls are almost certainly not going to learn about. And they're going to be told this falsehood that women are equal to men in Islam. The problem here is that these are women in Islam. They are little Muslim girls. They're going to grow up and get married, probably in just two or three more years. And then what? Then they're going to learn about the real Islam and how they were lied to in the Girl Scout troop. I think that's a disservice to these little girls. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something that could cause them a great deal of harm. Yeah, you, you and I are, are both in favor of uh, educating people about Islam, but I mean, tell the truth, right? <laughs> tell the truth. Exactly. Let, let these let these girls know the truth about Islam and then come to an informed decision about whether to uh, continue to embrace it or not. But what we always find is uh, when you're trying to keep people uh, confident in their belief in Islam, you just have to lie to them. And we see that over and over and over again. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna spout complete nonsense yeah. about Islam in order to make it sound like it's uh, like it's like it's good. And, and the, the problem, of course, is um, the facts are spreading so rapidly. My goodness, you can. I mean, look what they're trying to do. We have to we have to get these girls while they're really, really young. That was Muhammad's theory, right? We have to get these girls while they're really, really young so we can uh, brainwash them into thinking that it's all wonderful. And guess what? Uh, unless you're going to keep those girls away from the Internet their entire lives, they're eventually running into us. They're eventually running into us. And then they're going to find out the truth. And then they're going to find out, oh, everyone who told me about Islam was a great big liar. And then they're leaving Islam. Married anyway, most likely. And then and then we'll have, uh, then we'll have an entire... Girl Scout troop made up of ex-Muslims. How about that? Oh, that's the ex-Muslim Girl Scout troop. I look the forward to it. The ex-Muslim Girl I'm Scout sure Brigade. Story. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, where to go next? Uh, let, let me respond to a quick comment here while you're pulling up your uh, next story. Uh, L. L. Sure. Iso Elohim. Uh, you're a moderator. You're asking um, what the rules are. Uh, I haven't put out any official rules about being a moderator. I'm pretty laid back. I don't like blocking people for too much. But if people are, you know, cursing, posting, you know, really nasty comments, or if people are just coming along and then spamming, you know, on some completely different topic, in order to distract people from the topic, uh, you know, you, you can give a warning, you know, you can give a warning or two uh, at first, but if, if someone's clearly there just to try and distract people away from a, from a, from a topic by going off on tangents, or if someone's just being a really nasty person, uh, you can, you can go ahead and block them, but kind of use that as a last resort. And so I'm saying that because uh, I've, I've, I've had people say, Hey, I want to be a moderator. And I, I click on the moderator and then they go block everyone they disagree with. And it's like, no, don't <laughs> not trying to block, not trying to block everyone. They can disagree with us. All right. So hopefully that clears okay. things up. All right. A uh, quick note from Africa. I noted that in Mozambique, you know, the Islamic state has a very strong foothold. They have captured the t province of Cabo Delgado pretty much completely which is near some very important oil fields and are expanding their domains there. And so now a coalition of militaries from South Africa, Rwanda, Botswana, Lesotho, Angola, and Zambia are all sending troops to Mozambique to fight the Islamic State jihadis. Now, obviously, South Africa, Rwanda, Botswana, Lesotho, Angola, and Zambia, they are not known to be great military powers. However, what I think is noteworthy about this is that the Islamic State was supposed to have been destroyed a few years ago when it was driven out of Iraq and Syria and its caliphate destroyed. And yet now you have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six countries getting together to try to stamp it out in a seventh country, far away from Iraq and Syria. And what nobody seems to remark about this is that the Islamic State keeps growing and keeps spreading. And this is because it keeps convincing Muslims that its understanding of Islam is correct. And because it is able to continue to make recruits, it continues to grow. And also, not, uh, not least of, of, of all in this, is that it also is able to attract donors, rich, 
well-heeled Muslims who believe that it is the right thing to do to support ISIS. And so they send it money so they're able to get weapons and hold off the formidable militaries of South Africa, Rwanda, Botswana, Lesotho, Angola, and Zambia. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. I mean, the, the last thing I want to smile at is uh, is jihad. But when you were when you were when you were rattling off those mm-hmm. all those countries, did anyone else remember? I forget what they were called. The Animaniacs. What were they called? I remember the. There was this. There was this. There was a song. It was when I was a teenager, but uh, people were playing the song to memorize the countries of the world. And it starts off like uh, United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too, right? But the when you were when you were listing off the countries, it sounded like when they were going through all the countries of uh, of Africa, and so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That was way back because I'm my goodness. I'm 45 now. So you're talking. You're talking. 45. Th- you're I talking like you're talking like 30 years ago. That was that was uh circulating. I was uh, being bored in high school when you were born, young man. Okay. Louis Algarib, who is a lawyer, or was a lawyer, in the UK was caught on video injecting his own blood into food at a supermarket. And when he was caught, he threw eggs at the customers, pushed down a security guard trying to escape, and he is now on trial. What's interesting about this is that there is a steady stream of stories that I get at Jihad Watch of jihadis poisoning food or trying to poison food, spitting in food, poisoning water supplies or trying to, and so on. This is a long-standing jihad imperative. We've even seen it in the United States. In Wichita in 2013, the FBI was investigating a possible water supply threat. In 2014 in New Jersey, a Muslim broke into a water treatment plant and was caught there before he could do anything. We have also seen this in Canada, in India, and in many other areas. Pretty gross. Yeah, and it's weird because, uh, you know, it's not halal to drink another person's blood, except Muhammad. Uh, his followers would would rub his spit on their faces, uh, drink his urine. Uh, it, it's uh, One woman accidentally drank the drank his pee out of a pot and he said, uh, you'll you'll never be you'll never have stubble, stomach troubles again. And uh, supposedly his saliva had miraculous, <laughs> miraculous property. Nabil was the one who told me about that way back in the day, and then I and then I actually read it. I was like, my goodness. Uh, and then supposedly, you know, like if he, he sucked on a boy's tongue or 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 let the boy suck on his tongue, then you know that boy would uh, that boy's lips or tongue would never taste hellfire. And uh, I and when, when I saw Muslims try to defend that, they argued that his saliva had all these miraculous properties like if you got some of his spit you were basically you know you had that was muhammad's miracle magic cure-all right there and then uh and then of course there one of the the guys who was spitting on food in india he said that he invoked that in his defense wow quite recently he Mm -hmm. said this you don't understand this is a a manner of blessing but of course what it really goes back to is chapter 9 verse 28 of the quran the infidels are unclean and this just reaffirms their unclean status Mm -hmm. and uh by the way we do have passages about drinking muhammad's blood and you get injured people rush rush up with a cop oh let me get that let me get that good prophet blood that's in the hadith of barnabas collins isn't it uh is that is that from that weird uh that weird uh soap opera Yes, yes, he was the vampire. I didn't see that one. I saw the one with uh, like Johnny Depp, the remake. They made a movie about it or something. I saw that way back when I was like eight years old in 1970. Uh, it was on television. It was very scary. Something, when you're something Shadows, right? Dark Shadows or uh, something? Yeah, Dark Shadows. That's it. Okay. Uh, also in the UK, we have a very interesting story from uh, February 28th. Muslims enraged as a teacher, uses a photo of Osama bin Laden to depict Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. He was doing a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> at All Saints Academy. This teacher of the year right here. This is like teacher, <laughs> global teacher of the year right here. In his PowerPoint, he shows this picture of Osama bin Laden and written next to it, it said, Muhammad, last prophet in Islam. 
And so, of course, he's been suspended. Muslims are complaining about the Islamophobic school. The school has issued an abject apology saying All Saints Academy recognizes the deep hurt and distress that has been caused to the Muslim community. Blah, blah, blah. The Academy reiterates its unreserved and sincere apology. Now, you know what that means. That what they really mean is, please don't blow us up. Please don't behead anybody. <clears throat> Samuel Paty, the school teacher in, in, in Paris, was showing cartoon of Muhammad to his class in a class about free speech. He was beheaded on the street outside the school. And so it's a very reasonable thing. But their groveling and their apologies are not going to make it may prevent somebody from being beheaded in this instance, but it's only going to encourage more Sharia in Britain. Yeah, it only it, when you throw a big tantrum and then you get your way, it just encourages you, hey, the way to get what I want is by throwing tantrums and making everyone think I'm about to go on a violent uh, killing spree. But if, if I were that teacher, in my own defense, I would say, hey, you know, I needed to make a good PowerPoint. And when it came to Muhammad, I, there is no picture of him. Um, so it was either Osama bin Laden or the one of the Muhammad cartoons. And I definitely didn't want to use one of those because the, the people who use those get killed. So I went with Osama bin Laden. I now rest my airtight case. Also, it must be said, David, I, I'm sorry, but it must be said. What about Osama bin Laden's actions would Muhammad reject? I remember years and years ago, actually right after 9-11, when I was talking to uh, the publisher of my books, and he was running another book by me that was being written very very uh, quickly, right after 9-11, and said Muhammad would have been appalled at 9-11. And I said, no, that wasn't the case. And in the book I wrote right after 9-11, I explained why that was not the case, that Muhammad told his followers to wage war against unbelievers. They did this on 9-11. What, what, on earth, what exactly about it would Muhammad have rejected, going by the picture of Muhammad we find in the Hadith? Mm -hmm. Nothing. There isn't anything. No. No. So I think it's a really good choice, actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to depict Osama bin Laden as Muhammad. Uh -huh. Now, Osama now what, what, I, what I would disagree with is the Hadith state over and over and over again how white Muhammad was. I mean, they, they act like he was the whitest person who'd ever walked the planet, and Osama bin Laden just doesn't uh, look like that. So if I wanted to criticize it, matter of fact, maybe I should do a video on this. The reason you shouldn't, the reason you shouldn't use Osama bin Laden as a picture of Muhammad is because so Johnny Winters should play Muhammad. Yeah, who's that? Johnny Winters should play Muhammad. Who's that? The blues guitarist. But, He's an albino. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You you need an you need an albino. Uh, here, let me let me address a quick comment here because uh, uh, we have someone um, having a discussion over in the chat. Uh, but uh, he says, if I had the chance to speak, I would have explained. I'm really sad to see the way these guys are making up so much and talking nonsense. Tell us anything we've made up. <laughs> Tell us anything we've. I will put. I'll time. put the source up on the screen for you. I mean, most yeah. of most of what you're saying, we're just reading sources out of the news. So I mean, are, is, you're saying Robert's making up all these uh, news stories. Go to his website, Jihad Watch, and he's got he's got the stories right there. You can you can uh, you can check anything. Well, uh, all the are are named and linked, folks. None of this is made up, and it's all readily documentable. Yeah, and so he says, uh, uh, Quran doesn't, I don't know, wait, is, is he even responding? Is he responding to us or to someone else? Because he says, Quran doesn't tell us to disrespect Bible or Jesus. We haven't been talking about that. Maybe he's responding to someone in the uh, chat. He says, we love Jesus. Yeah, uh, but disrespected Bible or Jesus. Yeah, but he says, Quran doesn't tell us to disrespect Bible. Hey, now, my Muslim friend, you have that absolutely correct. The Quran does nothing. Ever. I, I've been defending this for years. The Quran does nothing ever except affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. You are absolutely correct. It's the vast, overwhelming majority of Muslims around the world who, thinks, who think that the Quran says the Bible's been corrupted. They're totally wrong. The Quran affirms inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. It affirms them as the word of God and commands Jews and Christians to continue judging by them, not by the Quran. Surah 5, verse 43, when a problem was brought to Muhammad by the Jews, Allah's response is, why are they coming to you, Muhammad, when they have the Torah? 
And then a few verses later, uh, chapter 5, verse 47, Allah commands Christians judge by the gospel. And so you're absolutely correct. The problem is the Quran, the Quran contradicts the Torah and the gospel on basic fundamental doctrines. And so two possibilities. Notice, uh, either we have the word of God or we don't. If we have the word of God, Islam is false because it contradicts the word of God. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false because it affirms what we have as the word of God. So either way, Islam is false. My friend, you got to leave your religion. Uh, as for uh, loving Jesus, no, you love what Muhammad said about Jesus, which bears very little resemblance to the actual Jesus who walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee. When you, when you degrade Jesus from the risen Lord to someone who walked around prophesying about Muhammad, whose main function in life is to prophesy Muhammad, and who accomplished nothing else in life. Say, oh, he did accomplish. No. I mean, everything he did was just wiped out. And you say, oh, the Apostle Paul changed everything or something, right? Or it changed the Council of Nicaea. Anyway, he was a miserable failure, according to your religion. That's not respecting Jesus. And it, it, it would be like, it would be like uh, uh, you say, uh, hey, I'm going to go respect. I respect Elon Musk. I respect Elon Musk. You say, okay, who's Elon Musk? Oh, he's uh, he's my dog. Well, we're not talking about the same Elon Musk, then, right? You're not you're not respecting Elon Musk by saying he's your dog. Similarly, you're not respecting the Lord Jesus by calling him uh, a prophet of your fake god. So, just had to say that. All right, Robert, back to uh, jihad news. I've got one that I meant to mention before when we were talking about the uh, guy who was injecting food with blood, but uh, this is directly related to what you've just been saying, David. Uh, and this is a video. This gentleman can't dispute this didn't happen. I got the video right there on the site. A uh, priest in France on February 27th, last Sunday, was blessing the churchyard after Mass. This was at Saint-Michel Church in Bordeaux in France. And the priest, you can see in the video, is walking around uh, and giving blessing to the area and the people, and a Muslim walks by and spits at him. He spits at him, of course, because the Quran says in chapter 5, verse 17, and again in 572, unbelievers are those who say Allah is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of Mary. The Quran says in chapter 9, verse 30, that if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you're under the curse of Allah. So this guy who is preaching these things, the Trinity, which is also denied, chapter 19, verse 35 of the Quran, preaching the divinity of Christ, which is denied in the Quran, the Muslim holds him in contempt because he is, of course, as we have noted many times, according to chapter 98, verse 6, the most vile of created beings. Thus, the spit is a gesture of that contempt for the vile being. And it... Uh... It is interesting because, uh, I mean, in spite of all the stuff I do to expose Muhammad and the Quran, uh, you know, I do get the death threats all the time and stuff. But, but you know, seeing Muslims on the street and so on, I've never had anyone spit at me or, or do anything like that. And so it, it just does seem to change as the population changes. You start the, the percentages start going higher and the contempt for non-muslims grows and it's not ju it's not just that you know that your muslim friend here in the united states is deceiving you and he's waiting to insult and degrade you once he gets the opportunity it's that as the population grows the people who the leaders the leaders of the community the people who know what the Muslim sources say about sh demonstrating your contempt for the unbelievers. I mean, Muhammad said, don't give the Jews and the Christians the uh, the greeting first. Force them to the narrowest part of the road. I mean, you're supposed to push them aside as you're walking down the street. You're supposed to you're supposed to bully them. Um, so the, the ones who know that start informing the rest of the population. And it increases, increases, increases. And that's preparing them until you've got a certain uh, critical mass. And then it's uh, and then it's jihad. Oh, yeah. And these are not, uh, this is not a dead letter. This is not something that we found in dusty books. I remember talking to a guy from Lebanon, and he told me that his father would tell him about how when he was growing up, he had to get to the side of the road. He had to let the Muslims pass. This was just understood. And if he didn't do it, he was risking getting beat up or worse. And this was based on the statement of Muhammad that David just quoted. 
I'll uh, uh, quick comment right here. Yolo said, uh, I challenge David to come to the Middle East and say this if he believe in his Bible. Uh, Yolo, I already been to the Middle East. I went to Israel. <laughs> already been already been to the Middle East, and I do believe this. So, hey, well, so challenge met. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Robert. A wild story here, David. This is a really, I hope I get this right. Let's see. This is a woman named Yasmina Ali, and she was raised a Muslim in Afghanistan. She was born in Kabul in 1993, immigrated to the UK in the early 2000s with her family. And her father was provided asylum, granted asylum in the UK. But in the UK, Yasmina Ali began to feel suffocated by the strict Islamic practice of her family. As a teenager, she ran away. She met a Jewish man. She married him. She converted to Judaism. Ultimately, she became a porn star. So, she... <laughs> that was a very Spocky and eyebrow there. Yeah, I was she, wondering where uh, you're going with this story. <laughs> her father, Mohammed Patman, and her cousin, Darya Khan Safi, hired a hitman to kill her, hired him for $70,000. The plot was discovered, and they are now awaiting trial. But it's noteworthy that the hitman was hired because she married a Jew. <laughs> the porn star business is, is, is bad. And I can understand any father would be absolutely appalled mm -hmm. if his daughter got involved in that. Although trying to kill her is another thing. But it seems as if he was more enraged that she had left Islam and married a Jew than with the profession that she had chosen. In any case, the whole idea of honor killing we've discussed in previous weeks is based on uh, the uh, imperative to obey and the, the that you have explained that if you do not obey what Muhammad and Allah have set out, then you're an unbeliever, you're an unbeliever you're to be killed then there's the example of Kidder in chapter 18 of the Quran who kills a boy because he's going to grow up to be unrighteous and his parents deserve a better child and so on and many have a... countries have relaxed penalties for honor killing and it's within this context this culture mm -hmm. that this man hires a hitman to murder his own daughter and you've got a uh... As I've talked about, when you when you put the teachings together, you've got the command to kill apostates. Um, you've got Muhammad saying that anyone who uh, doubts any of his teachings isn't a real Muslim. And then you've got uh, you've got the command in Sunan Ibn Majah to carry out Allah's penalties even against your own family members. And so you kind of put this stuff together, and you're getting a bloodbath. I do want to respond very quickly to. Um, uh, Christian Hijab here said, does anyone know the source of pushing them in the narrowest part of the road? Uh, that's in a lot of places in the Muslim sources. Um, I, I'm, I'm giving you a link right here. I just went ahead and pulled it up in, in Sahih Muslim. They're, they're, uh, uh, it's in a lot of places. So anyway, I'm giving you a link to one right now. All right. Okay. Here's another one. Here's one out of Egypt that is related to honor killing, has to do with disciplining the disobedient woman. Of course, we are often told that you're only supposed to beat your disobedient wife with a toothbrush, a miswak, and that this is not something that anybody need be concerned about in the West. However, on February 7th, Ahmad Karima, who is a professor of Sharia, of Islamic law. Wait, so this guy knows his stuff? Yeah, at Al-Azhar. Okay, so that's the man. Of, this is the man. So now we're gonna now we're gonna hear now we're gonna get the 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 the, the, the toothbrush treatment or the <laughs> the grass treatment. I've heard the grass too. You you shake some grass at them, but yeah. All right, now now we get the truth. All right. Okay, so he says without he says that uh, he first quotes the passage. As for the women of whom you fear disobedience, admonish them, forsake them in bed, and beat them. Then if they obey you. Do not seek other ways to harm them. While discussing this verse, the jurisprudence did not interpret that admonishing wives, forsaking them in bed, and beating them without causing harm is a necessary religious duty. No, it is just permitted. It is neither mandatory nor recommended. 
but it is permitted. So Ahmed Karima is saying, you don't have to be your wife. And, and, you and, may choose not to do so. However, if you do so, there is nothing wrong with doing that. It is something that is permitted by Allah himself. And there, I would agree with him completely. You you do get that impression from the Muslim source. You don't have to be, and you had you had different punishments. You could warn her. You could banish her to a separate bed. You could uh, you could beat her. You could do all these different things. But it's not very very specific. It's based on when it says if you fear rebellion or if you fear something like that. So it's it's sort of your own subjective feeling. As a man deciding what to do, and so yes, that is that is the most accurate defense I can see you giving while still while not lying about what the sources say. So, yeah, you say it's not saying we have to; it's saying we can beat them. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one connected to some of the earlier stories we spoke about, like the man spitting on the priest in France. This is out of Greece. A report from Greece's Mil Ministry of Education and Religious Affairs has found 2,339 incidents of desecration of the country's Greek Orthodox churches during the five-year period between 2015 and 2020. Now, that is the same period in which there has been a sharp influx of migration of Muslims into Greece. And so it seems very likely, as a matter of fact, the Greek City Times news story says that there appears to be a correlation between the increase in illegal migration, and that illegal migration is largely from Turkey, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from elsewhere in the Islamic world, and the incidence of attacks on Greek Orthodox churches. Now, that is because of the same things I delineated a few minutes ago, that the churches have images, and images are forbidden in Islam. The churches hold to the Trinity, to the divinity of Christ, to the resurrection, to all, to the crucifixion, to all manner of things that Islam explicitly denies. And hence, these are idolat places of idolatry and shirk, and consequently, the people who desecrated them no doubt believed that they were being righteous when they did so. Yeah, and so it's another situation where... Um, we're so we're I mean in the I, ideal Muslim world we're supposed to feel ourselves subdued uh, we're supposed to be second class citizens if we're allowed to continue existing at all and the only way we would be allowed to continue to exist is if we acknowledged our inferiority and paid uh, sums of money to the Muslim authorities to continue to exist but uh, you have the again these passages about deliberately mistreating Jews and Christians, even if they're allowed, even if they're you know taking on demi status, and so it's just again, what's the for those Muslims who would say no, it doesn't really teach this. You're misrepresenting and misinterpreting all of this. Well, guess what? There are tons of there are tons of followers of Muhammad who are misinterpreting it in exactly the same way we're misinterpreting it. So once again, we're left with these two possibilities. What's the difference between a religion that actually calls for the mistreatment of unbelievers just because they're unbelievers, and two, a religion that doesn't actually call for the violent mistreatment of unbelievers simply for being unbelievers but it really really sounds like it does because the god and the prophet are so massively unclear in what they say you get the same result right if it, if, if allah means what he says this is what you get if he means something different from what he says well there's still people are going to go with what it sounds like he means and so you're going to get the same thing and so guess what i mean shouldn't we be appalled either way if you say, no, what it really means is this completely different thing. Well, then your, your God is the worst communicator in the history of forever. And that's a concern too. It's a concern if your God can never say what he means. That's that for me, that's for me, well, that's for me, that's worse than a God who says exactly what he means. And it's bad because in that case, you could say, guys, do we all agree this is really bad. This God who can't say what he means, but he's he's just blurting out all this, all these commands for violence that he doesn't really mean. That's more. That's even scarier. He said, he, not only can he never say what he means, but he's always insisting that everything he means is perfectly clear. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I got to get with this one in before we go. All right. This is out of Uganda. 
And this is a convert from Islam to Christianity named Malangumu Bruhan. And he had not seen his Muslim family for a few years, but he returned to the village where they all live for his grandfather's funeral. And then he recounts what happened. He says, my uncle accused me of embarrassing them by holding Christian evangelistic open air meetings and debates with Muslim. He accused me of being an infidel by converting to Christianity and that Allah will reward them in Jannah, paradise, if they kill me. He said to me that it is now the right time for me to receive punishment from Allah, whereby I was going to be burned alive and the birds of the air will enjoy me as their meat. And so they uh, started beating him up, gathering firewood to burn him alive. And uh, he ultimately, he was discovered by his friends and rescued and uh, taken to a clinic for treatment after being beaten and so on. But it's noteworthy that his uncle and his Muslim relatives said, Allah will reward them in paradise if they kill him. And this is, of course, because of the death penalty for apostasy. And Muhammad saying, if anyone changes his religion, kill him. Not only does that mean that the apostate should be killed, but somebody who carries out that command has done the will of Allah and will receive a reward. And consequently, a Muslim relative who has a convert to Christianity in his family has an actual incentive to do violence to that convert. And that's... a. Uh... That's one of the reasons we see with the honor killings where uh, a father will kill his daughter or a brother will kill his sister and they'll just admit it. And sometimes they'll go to the police station and say, yeah, I did it. They think that, hey, I've done something good here. I'm, I'm, I'm good with God. Even if you want to get me in trouble and throw me in jail, which you probably won't unless it's just for a show, um, it doesn't matter because I'm good with God because of what I've done. And so, uh, yeah, very, very sick stuff here. Okay, out of France. Recently, the Al Farouk Mosque in Pesach, in Gironde, was closed for six months. And the reason why it was closed for six months is because it was discovered to have been broadcasting, quote, a rigorous version of Islam and hateful publications against Israel. And people in the mosque are known for their membership in the Islamist movement and their Salafist ideology. And in short, they have been promoting armed jihad. Now, David, let me ask you a question. Do you mm -hmm. think that after six months when the Al Farouk Mosque reopens, that it's no longer going to preach armed jihad or have associations with Salafis, with people who believe in the letter of the Quran and the necessity to carry out every bit of it? Do you think that it will be completely changed and a, a, a totally secularized French version of Islam from now on? No, the, the, the best case scenario is that they'll say, okay, we just need to do a better job of, of uh, not letting people know what we're actually teaching here. And that's the best case scenario. But in actuality, it's the worst case scenario. Because, I mean, if they go from you knowing what they're teaching to them being more secretive about it as they build up their numbers... You're not solving the problem just because it's not in your face. You've just passed it on to the next generation. We're going to have to deal with the jihadis slaughtering them in the name of Allah. Exactly. And so it's not likely to be any help at all to close the mosque for six months. It's only going to make it more difficult for <laughs> French authorities to detect the same activity going on. And so it does not bode well, of course, for the future of France. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speaking of not voting well for the future, I'll close with a little story out of Canada about a gentleman named David Mastracci, who is the editor of Passage, a far-left Canadian publication, and he calls himself an aspiring Marxist. And recently he tweeted that the Canadian government should be sending weapons to the jihad terror group Hamas. And I think with, with friends like that, with people who believe that it is good to encourage and aid jihad activity, the West is in some serious trouble. And since that is something that's taken for granted among large sectors of the population. Yeah, and you combine that with uh, all these governments forming these task forces on uh, combating Islamophobia, 
wow, we are, uh, we are, <laughs> we yeah. we got some tactical geniuses on our side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rob, well, let, let, let me go and post this real quick because we have from YOLO again. Uh, Jihad is only used in self-defense. YOLO, you're just proving exactly what I've been saying. So Allah says in the Quran, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. You've got Muhammad in the Hadith. How does he interpret these passages? What does he say? I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. So these are, if you read these commands, it sounds an awful lot like they're saying fight people just because they're unbelievers. Go and fight people because of what they believe. You're saying, no, it's only self-defense. So what you're saying they really mean is, they, Allah really means fight those who do not believe in Allah if they come and attack you first, then in which case you can fight in self-defense. And what Muhammad really meant is, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, assuming they come and fight us first, in which case you can carry this out. In which case, exactly what I said, your God, your prophet are the absolute worst communicators ever. You would never accept that reasoning uh, from, you would never accept that excuse. If, a, if an American president or general came out and said, we're going to fight those who believe in Allah, you, you would shout from the rooftops how evil this is. Uh, and if he came out and said, well, what I really meant was just fight ISIS. We agree on fighting ISIS, right? You would not accept that. You would say, you, 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 if, if you're going to talk about killing people, you need to be really precise in your language and Allah who's the who brags about being the clearest communicator ever you're cutting him a lot of slack here uh, when he's talking about slaughtering people and and again it, it, assuming you're right great he's the worst communicator ever and a lot of people have been getting killed for 14 centuries millions of people over 14 centuries have been killed because your god is the worst communicator of all time all right robert well uh once again plenty of jihad even when i don't hear about it yeah, and there's plenty more, of course. Plenty more, but we're going to go ahead and, and, whoops, we lost Robert. Whoops. What happened there? I hit the wrong button there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we lost Robert. <laughs> I'm just getting too old for this technology. He man. clicked, bye, David. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to pull up a story, but bye. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I was actually going to go see. I've got quite a lot of... Uh, Tab's still open. There's always more jihad. There's always more even than we can cover at Jihad Watch, and we are the primary and I think the only site in the world that keeps track of it at all. Yep, and uh, if if all of this, if all of these attacks, if all of these attacks were coming from some church, I'm sure we'd all be hearing about it relentlessly day and night, but it's coming from the religion of peace, and so, nope, we got to be quiet about it. Uh, fortunately, Robert isn't quiet about, quiet about it, and uh, I'm not going to be quiet about it either. And so uh, join us next time. I'm sure we'll be here again, sadly, next week for all to cover the attacks that have happened from now until then. Catch y'all next week.